good day this is the second part of imaging concepts and recent advances in imaging of stroke in the first part we covered the basics of stroke which included the causes of stroke like subarachnoid hemorrhage parenchymal hemorrhage and what we are concentrating on today that is 80% which is formed by ischemic stroke we know what is stroke definition stroke definition is reduced blood flow and perfusion caused by thrombus embolus or hemorrhage there are three zones within the area of stroke which are identified ischemic core where the flow of blood is less than 12 ml passing through 100 grams of brain per minute ischemic penumbra where the flow is between 12 and 20 ml of blood and oligemic tissue where the flow is more than 20 ml of blood uh, we also understood the saying which talks about what you want is what you get and how the stroke imaging has evolved over the last 15 or 20 years in the last talk we covered three questions about stroke on imaging the first question being is there an infarct second question what is the cause of infarct and the third question is it reversible or not today we'll cover the other five questions one what kind of infarct intervention is possible in a patient of stroke if he or she reaches the stroke hospital within the given window period when it can be done what are the outcomes of treatments can we predict stroke before the complications happen what are the complications and how we can detect upcoming stroke before it happens so let's start with today's first question that is what are the kind of interventions available today in patients who are detected to have hyperacute or acute stroke again there's a saying timely intervention the concept is moving from just time is brain to physiology is brain and we'll understand that in next 5 or 6 slides the type of intervention that are available today if the patient comes within 3 to 6 hours of getting stroke intravenous and intraarterial thrombolysis within 3 hours intravenous can be good enough within 6 hours 3 to 6 hours the intraarterial is what is followed within intraarterial thrombolysis we have intraarterial drug injection and mechanical thrombolysis or thrombectomy this is one example of mechanical thrombectomy this patient came to us with a stroke duration of 1 and 1/2 hours we showed hyperacute right mca stroke on mri on dsa there is a large acute thrombus in the m1 segment of right mca this is pre procedure and this is post procedure dsa showing complete opening up of entire right mca and this is the thrombus which are located in the proximal m1 segment of right mca next question that we as a radiologist need to answer is when these interventions can be done the standard window period of 0 to 3 hours and 3 to 6 hours is rapidly changing with better thrombolytic drugs available and better understanding of stroke which we have acquired over last 10 to 15 years so window period of 3 hours is getting extended and window period beyond 3 hours is also getting extended from 3 hours to 4 and 1/2 hours and 6 hours and 12 hours in different locations and different sizes of stroke what we also need to predict on imaging is what is likely to be the outcome of thrombectomy or thrombolysis if that is performed that can be predicted by location of thrombus and also some certain imaging features which we'll understand in next four five slides so we know from history and predictions that mortality varies in the given patient by thrombus location for example if there is a large thrombus in basal artery the mortality is almost 90% if it is in terminal ica then the mortality is about 50% if it is in mca the mortality is about 30% also the outcome depends on types of stroke whether it is mild stroke major stroke or stroke caused by acute lacrimal infarct so in mild cv 
when there is no large vessel occlusion and infarcts are small, you have good outcome. If it is major LV or large vessel occlusion and the infarct is large, it has poor outcome. Whereas acute lacrimal infarct has got best outcome. Then there is concept of aspects or Alberta Stroke Program Early City Score, which divides MCA into 10 zones. Every area that is covered by stroke, one point is deducted. So if we have hypo intensity in two zones, your score will be 10 minus 2, that is 8. If it is located in six zones, your score would be four. And based on the entire outcome changes, we'll understand that in next slides. Also, because this aspect score became very popular in the supratentorial compartment, aspects has come out with the same type of scoring in posterior circulation as well. So where if the hypodensity is present in thalamus, occipital lobe, midbrain, pons, or cerebellum, certain points are deducted and whether it is supratentorial compartment or infratentorial compartment, a score of less than 7 has got bad prognosis, score of more than 7 has got good prognosis. There are other several clinical variables which impact the eventual outcome of a patient with stroke and these are time to treatment, post thrombolysis, hemorrhage whether it has happened or no on imaging, severity of stroke, age of the patient, race of the patient, weight of the patient, and BP and several other comorbidities. So that's what the outcome depends on. The next question that we need to answer when we are imaging these patients is, can we predict post-thrombolysis hemorrhage? If we can predict that, we can avoid several complications which happen with aggressive thrombolytic therapy. So post-thrombolysis hemorrhage is divided by ECAS classification into four types. The simple ones are smaller hemorrhages which are divided into HI1 and HI2. HI1 or hemorrhagic infarction type 1 is when you get particular hemorrhages at the margins of the infarct like this borrowed patient. Hemorrhagic infarction type 2 or HI2 is when the particular hemorrhages within infarct happen throughout the infarct. So these are minor hemorrhages and then there are two subtypes of parenchymal hematomas. PH1 is when less than 30% of the infarcted area bleeds with minor mass effect. Whereas PH2 or parenchymal hematoma type 2 is where more than 30% of the infarcted area shows hemorrhage. And there is major mass effect. Outcome in these patients is relatively poor compared to HI1 and HI2. There are several imaging predictors which also show the eventual outcome of the patient. For example, this particular patient who has got massive left emissary infarct on diffusion. Because it is covering almost 100 cc of brain parent karma, chance of this bleeding post thrombolysis is almost 95%. On your right hand side, you have patient with massive right ICA territory infarct. The hypodensity is obviously covering more than one third of the MCA territory and chances of this patient undergoing hemorrhage post thrombolysis is also very, very high. Second predictor is the location of area of infarction. Gray matter infarction has relatively higher risk of hemorrhage compared to infarct in the white matter area, which has relatively low risk. That is because there are several collaterals in the gray matter and it is highly vascular. We saw an aspect score, an aspect ratio of less than 7 or equal to 7 has got bad prognosis and chances of these patients bleeding are also very high. The third predictor is based on CT and MR perfusion. So, in the matched area of infarction or infarct core, where there is irreversible brain damage, chances of hemorrhage are quite high and this is an actual example. If the location is beyond the infarct core, chances of hemorrhage are lesser. The fourth predictor is based on angiography. So, if there is pile collateral formation on the DSA done before thrombolysis, 
if there is good collateral formation chances of hemorrhage are 2.7% or lesser if there is poor collateral formation the chances are 25% and more and here are two borrowed examples this particular patient has got terminal left ICA occlusion with a massive infarct post thrombectomy the ICA has opened up both ACA and MCAs are filling well but because this particular patient has poor collateralization this patient bled in the left basal ganglia with extension of the hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space and also in the ventricles compare that with this particular patient who has a right m1 segment thrombus with good collateralization on delayed dsa images this patient underwent thrombectomy and post thrombectomy ct does not show any evidence of hemorrhage so good collateral formation on pre thrombectomy dsa would have good outcome whereas that with poor collateralization will have poorer outcome the next question that we need to answer as a neuroradiologist is can we detect upcoming strokes in cases of prior stroke or tis before it actually happens basis of this is nasec study which was a multi centric multi country study performed in 1986 which talked about efficacy of carotid endarterectomy in patients which showed stenosis of between 70 and 99% what the study said is if a patient has carotid artery stenosis of between 70 to 99% and if you do carotid endarterectomy these patients perform much better than those put on antiplatelet therapy over the last 10 to 15 years lot of researchers realized that this prediction was not as accurate as it was thought in 80s and 90s what we now know is stroke genesis is an atheroembolic phenomena and not really related to low flow in carotid artery contrary to our understanding in coronary arteries and lot of researchers presented their own work which said that almost 75% or more of stroke events happen in patients who have moderately stenosed vessels lot of them showing less than 50% stenosis so now we know that stroke genesis is an atheroembolic phenomena and not really a low flow phenomenon which is present in coronary vessels hence the new terminology for plaque came in so plaques which are likely to cause stroke are considered as vulnerable plaques and the plaques which actually give rise to stroke are called as culprit hr mr and doppler are known to detect these culprit plaques before they strike for this we must understand the plaque classification which was put forth by american heart association and how we can show that on doppler and on mr angiography so american heart association has divided plaques into eight subtypes what we should be aware of are type 4 5 and 6 plaques which contain lipid rich necrotic core in the center with fibrous cap or plaques which contain hemorrhage within the core of the plaque because these are unstable plaques and likely to embolize in the brain compared to type 7 and 8 plaques which contain calcification and fibrous tissue hrmr has excellent soft tissue contrast it shows accurate in vivo depiction of plaque and it also quantifies the narrowing so there is a new concept of plaque load which looks at the content of plaque and the size or volume of the plaque and hrmr can do that very well and here is an actual example the mr brain images of this particular patient i showed in part 1 of this talk where this particular patient had a huge right mc stroke if you look at this high resolution plaque imaging which are done subsequently 
you can see a hemorrhagic plaque which is bright on T1 and fat sac T1 both and part of the plaque has ulcerated, the cap is denuded and it is probably embolized creating a big crater over here. So we know we are dealing with an unstable hemorrhagic type 6 plaque which again is likely to embolize and cause another stroke. So this particular patient, although the narrowing is close to about 50-60%, is the candidate for carotid endarterectomy or stenting. Coming to what is the current status of treatment and imaging of hyperactive stroke. So most of the researchers are now moving from wall clock-like situation to tissue clock-like situation because we have to understand the pathophysiology and not only the anatomy of stroke. So, idea is to identify group of acute stroke patients who could benefit from thrombolytic therapy. Do a normal plain CT, look for hyperdense MCA sign with involvement of less than one third of MCA territory. These are right candidates in the given time for either thrombectomy or intravenous thrombolysis. If you are doing MR, look for microhemorrhages, leptomeningeal enhancement, which are relative contraindications for active treatment of hyperacute stroke. The issue that is always raised is whether CT is better or MR is better for hyperacute stroke. I am going to answer that a little later. But there are several proponents of MRI like me who talk about how MR can be done on good machine within a matter of 8 to 12 minutes getting much more information than what a CT with CT perfusion can give. So, a lot of researchers say that if you are going to give intravenous thrombolysis or breach therapy, just do a quick T2 diffusion and circle of Wills angio, which can happen in 6 to 7 minutes. Give half the dose of thrombolysis in the MR suite itself and then complete the rest of the study, which will give you complete information. What are the current ACR guidelines for imaging hyperactive stroke? This is a relatively busy slide, which is kind of simplified in the next slide. And if you look at the ACR guidelines of 2016, whether you're dealing with patient of PIA, hyperacute, acute, or early subacute stroke, all four, that is MRI, MRA, CT, and CT angio, get marks of 8 on 8. So that means all are the most appropriate investigations in patients with hyperacute, acute and early subacute stroke. So it really depends on how you have prepared yourself to treat and image these patients with hyperacute or acute stroke. What we as radiologists must know is time is brain and in the typical patient with large vessel occlusion, almost 1.9 million of neurons get damaged every minute the patient's treatment goes delayed. So the onus is on us to make sure that we do not waste any time and a good collaboration of teamwork between emergency department, neurologist and radiologist is the way forward to minimize the brain damage and give earliest possible treatment to appropriate candidates. Let's now move on to a few advances and what is going to happen in the future for stroke imaging. There are several new modalities which are coming in, in MRI itself, which hold promise of further refining patient classification to improvise patient management and hence the outcomes. There are four relatively new things which will completely change the way we image patients with stroke. Two of these we are currently using, two of these we may use in future much more. So let's look at all these four options which will change the way we image stroke. Let's start with ASL imaging or arterial spin labeling in stroke. Currently it is used for evaluation of penumbral zone and look at diffusion perfusion mismatch. Also, it can localize the intra-arterial acute thrombus. It is very, very useful in 
demonstrating post therapeutic hyperperfusion and reversibility of ischemic core and penumbra and also it is very very useful to exclude stroke mimics typically post ictal state and here are two examples on your left hand side you have diffusion abnormality and perfusion abnormality almost same so outcome of this patient is not going to be as good as the patient on your right side where diffusion abnormality is small and perfusion abnormality is really large so that is the usefulness of asm here is another patient where you have thrombus in right mca acute thrombus in right mca which is very well demonstrated on asl imaging so bright vessel sign is one thing that we really do not look for but if you look for it you will see it very very often other area where asl is very useful is post therapeutic hyperperfusion and here is our patient with left mc stroke which i showed in last lecture and here is an mri done after 24 hours of thrombectomy the diffusion abnormality is significantly reduced the perfusion abnormality you see a lot of revascularization in the posterior half of this left mca stroke next new advance in stroke imaging is swan imaging or susceptibility weighted imaging this was first described by hacke in 2004 it is now an essential part of any hyperacute stroke protocol it is very very useful to differentiate hypoperfusion from delayed perfusion in patients where diffusion abnormality is suspect it can also detect thrombus like asl it shows better depiction of hemorrhagic transformation than any other sequence and there are two signs which are described i am going to show you one example of each of these one is susceptibility vessel sign and two is prominent vessel sign susceptibility vessel sign is useful to show hyperacute thrombus so this thrombus which is paramagnetic produces blooming artifact and here is an example of the same when this hyperacute thrombus is present at the site of thrombus diameter of the vessel because of blooming appears larger than the diameter of contralateral artery so this is one way of making sure that you are dealing with a hyperacute thrombus second thing that we look for is prominent vessel sign that happens due to increased deoxygenated blood in the draining veins which appear prominent and hypointense in the infarcted area and here is a borrowed example of the same this is 63 year old woman who had diagnosis of left mca artery infarct the area of infarct shows multiple prominent veins which are showing susceptibility effect which is excellently correlating with the diffusion abnormality and cbb abnormality seen on the top of these four images next new important sequence which is coming up is diffusion cortices imaging what is the difference between normal diffusion that we look at versus dki or diffusion cortices image the standard diffusion measures gaussian distribution of water diffusion in biological systems whereas dki is based on non gaussian distribution and this effect is taken into account when you are looking at diffusion abnormality all of us now know that diffusion abnormality does not show the true core because there are several studies which show that subsequent scans show decrease in diffusion abnormality so dki is supposed to be changing the way we look at diffusion dki will actually show the core and not what the diffusion abnormality shows and here are two borrowed examples of the same here is a patient with a small m1 territory left mca infarct this is the diffusion abnormality this is the cortices abnormality and this is the follow up scan showing gliosis all three are matching problem is when these do not match and here is another borrowed example of left mca territory and posterior watershed hyperacute infarct this is the diffusion abnormality this is the cortices abnormality and this is the follow up scan showing gliosis on t2 if you look at these three images gliosis is absolutely correlating with cortices abnormality 
and not so much with diffusion abnormality. So we now know that DKI is more accurate in detecting core of the infarct and not so much diffusion abnormality. Next, we'll look at pH MRI, which is useful in hyperacute stroke imaging. The disturbing metabolic activity that is associated with hyperacute infarct correlates very well with pH MRI because pH drop is supposed to precede drop in CBF. Currently, we look at drop in CBF. When we will be able to look at drop in pH, that will precede the drop in CBF. We can detect hyperacute stroke using pH imaging much earlier. With DKI and pH imaging coming in, we'll have to probably revisit the mismatch model. So two abnormalities, diffusion and perfusion abnormality, zone 1 and zone 2 that we're talking about, will then be divided into four subzones. The diffusion lesion will be divided into curtisis lesion and diffusion curtisis mismatch lesion. The perfusion diffusion mismatch, that is zone 2, would be further divided into pH diffusion mismatch and perfusion pH mismatch. And we'll then have better delineation of ischemic core, ischemic penumbra and benign oligemia. So to conclude, imaging plays a critical role in stroke management. Diffusion is the stroke sequence with ongoing advances in imaging protocols. We will get imaging which is more robust and more rapid. Penumbra mapping which is currently a problem and it should be a part of imaging protocol would get more refined with pH imaging and curtisis imaging coming in future. What we must remember is as a radiologist we must insist on getting these patients imaged as quickly as possible and never forget time is brain. Thank you for your attention.